Hey, welcome everybody. I'm going to give people a little bit of time. Not that we're traveling, thank goodness, we're not dealing with the snow and ice physically this evening. Um, but we'll just give a couple more minutes to let people um, join us and get settled in, and then we'll get started. Just gonna give it just a, another minute or so, and then we'll get going. We don't wanna start too late, but I also don't wanna leave people out. All right, um, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. I know it's some strange weather out there, so it's pretty easy for, uh, for us to have our eye watching the weather and uh, a lot of different things this evening. So thank you for joining us. Again, grateful that nobody had to travel to, to be here because um, we probably would have had to postpone this. I'm Karen Kraus. I'm the executive director of the Feral Cat Coalition of Oregon. And I am really pleased this evening um, to be able to bring our pro bono attorney, our fabulous, thoughtful, cat loving pro bono attorney, Vanessa Usue. Um, she is an attorney with Duffy Keckel, and the law firm is located downtown. And um, she has a focus that's on estate planning, administration, and charitable giving. So she really is very well versed and experienced. And um, what I particularly like from what we've talked about in the past, Vanessa, is how you can talk about this at so many different levels. You know it inside and out, but you don't necessarily talk about it at a level that's beyond the reach of wherever the person you're speaking with is, which is really um, a beautiful skill, talent, and, and definitely helpful. So as we go through this tonight, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A, which is down below. Um, and I, I'll pick them up and I can share them with Vanessa. Um, so don't hesitate. If there's something that you don't understand or something you'd like more information on, do please um, feel free to um, let me know and I will then get that to Vanessa. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Vanessa, who will be walking us through a, a number of different ways that you can uh, include charitable gifts in your planning. Hi, Vanessa. Thank you, Karen. Hi, hi, everybody. All right, let me figure out sharing the screen here with everyone. All right. So, okay, there we go. Um, so thanks for being here and please, I do encourage you to let me know if you have questions. I'll make little pauses here and ask Karen if there are any questions. So this could be more interactive for folks. Um, but as she said, I'm with the firm of Duffy Keckel. Uh, we are a firm downtown in Portland. We're a boutique firm. So we're all estate planners. Um, and so this is our area of focus. And I'll be talking to you guys today about charitable gifting options. And let me see. so this is our agenda. 
And first off, this might be the only time in my career where I get to include my cats as the graphics on my slides and not have it be strange. So there's Stanley, Clementine, and Benny. Um, and so the things I'm going to cover are some common questions that I hear from clients related to charitable giving, some income tax strategies for folks who are not itemizing their deductions, what options people might have for appreciated property, and options for, you know, maybe you're in a situation where you want to make some charitable gifts, but you need to keep some sort of benefit in the asset. And then also a discussion of ways that you can include charity in your estate plan. So here are some questions that I hear from clients in my practice. You know, hey, I'm no longer itemizing my deductions because the standard deduction is so high. Can I still get a tax benefit for my charitable gifts? Uh, questions about what to do with appreciated property. Or like I mentioned, folks who want to make some charitable gifts, but maybe they need to retain some income from those assets. And then also I talk a lot with folks who have, are fortunate enough to have estates that may be subject to estate taxes. And they're concerned about that. They wanna know about ways they can minimize the estate taxes that might be imposed when they die. So we're gonna start off with the income tax strategies for not itemizers and I'll go through what the issue is and a couple of options for handling them. Um, so here's the issue. We have Clementine, she's very responsible and she's paid off her house. So she no longer has a mortgage and she's very frugal. Um, she's been able to retire early so she doesn't have a lot of uh, income tax, uh, you know, income from her um, employment, but she does have some capital gains tax and so forth from her investments. Um, but because she's paid off her house and she doesn't have a mortgage, and because the uh, recent changes to the tax law have limited her ability to deduct uh, state taxes to $10,000, she's no longer itemizing because the standard deduction is now $12,550 for an individual or $25,100 for a married couple filing jointly. So a lot of folks just don't find that they get a better benefit by taking the standard deduction and not itemizing their deductions. Now that's a problem for them because charitable deductions are called above the line deductions, which means in general, they're only available to folks who itemize. So if you're making a charitable gift, but you're taking a, a standard deduction, you're not actually getting a charitable deduction for those gifts that you made. And so there's some tax benefits that potentially you're missing out on. Um, because the standard deduction is so high. So we've got a couple of options of ways to handle that. One is a pretty elegant solution. So if you have an IRA, and if you're, if you're in this, if you're over 70 and a half, it used to be if you had to take your required minimum distributions, but actually now you can, it's just 70 and a half, even though you might not have to take uh, the distribution until 72. You can actually tell your IRA provider to just transfer money directly from your IRA to the charity. And the benefit of doing this is that if you instead accepted the assets, you know, took a withdrawal from your IRA directly to yourself, that's income. So you're going to have to report income on your income tax return. And then you get a corresponding charitable deduction if you itemize when you make a contribution to charity. But here, if you do a rollover, so the money never goes to your hands, it just goes directly from your IRA to the charity, you don't have to report that distribution as income. So even if you're not itemizing, you're still gonna get the benefit of getting these assets to charity and um, not you know, because you're not recognizing the income, you're not taking a charitable deduction, but you're in the same place you would be had you had to take other assets that were income producing and then make a donation. There are a couple of restrictions on this. So for one, you have to be 70 and a half or older to do it. It has to be from an IRA. It can't be from like a 401k. So for some clients in that situation, some 401k or profit sharing plans do have an option for you to take what's called an in-service distribution. So we have you distribute money from your 401k to an IRA, and then you can use that to make the charitable rollover. Um, the rollover cannot exceed $100,000 per year. I mean, you could do more than that, but you're gonna pay tax on the distribution of the amount over 100,000. And the recipient must be a public charity um, like the Feral Cat Coalition, it can't be a private foundation or a donor advised fund. So that's one option for folks who maybe have more IRA assets than they, you know, they don't need the IRA distributions right now. They can use that as a source for their charitable giving. Another option is for folks to use a donor advised fund and, and do what we've been calling bunching. So a donor advised fund is something that you set up with 
maybe Oregon Community Foundation or Fidelity or Vanguard or Schwab, you know, they have low um, entry requirements. So for example, I think Schwab only requires $5,000 to make a contribution to their donor advised fund. And the donor advised fund itself is a public charity. So when you make the distribute, when you make the contribution to your donor advised fund, you get a charitable deduction that year for your contribution. But then you can take time to make distributions out of the donor advised funds to your target charities. So every year you can decide I'm going to give some to these folks and some to these folks, um, but you don't have to do it all at once. And there's no generally there's no time limit on that. So what folks do is they make a they they kind of look at you know on average how much do I contribute per year to charity? Maybe I bunch them. So I will do five years worth of charitable contributions in year one. And that's enough to get me over the standard deduction. So it now makes sense for me to itemize my deductions that year and I get the benefit of my charitable contributions. But then over the next three or five years or what have you, I don't make any other charitable contributions because I've got this pool of money sitting in my donor advised fund and I use that as my source of making the gifts. So I'm making gifts to charity, but the taxable event happened in year one. Um, another I thing that's, Go ahead. Can I can I ask you a question that that, that yes. just came up? Um, sure. What happens if you have an unexpected death or die younger than 70 and a half and want to make sure your assets go to the cause you want? Um, I will be discussing that in the estate planning section. Okay. So that's a good okay. question and I will All get right. to that. All right. Thank you. Of course. Um, so another thing that people like about the donor advised funds is I'm hearing from a lot of clients that it's actually making their charitable giving a lot easier. Because, for example, with Schwab, what it ends up being is you make this contribution to them. So you send them the money, they set up a fund, you're the donor and maybe or the advisor, and maybe you have other people like family members who help you with it. But you just go onto a website and you say, you just put the name of the charity, it finds the charitable information, you say, send $500 to this charity, and you're done. You don't have to wait to get that receipt back from the charity and make sure you hold on to it to give it to your CPA and all of that. It, they handle all of that for you. So it's, it's not only is there some tax advantages, I think a lot of clients are finding that it's streamlining the charitable giving and making it easier. And you can also, and we'll talk about this again later in the estate planning section, you can also use a DAF as a beneficiary of your estate plan. Um, and so that's a great option too, um, that we'll discuss uh, some pros there. Um, and then another option that's specific to this year, I said that generally charitable contributions are above the line or below the line. So you need to be uh, taking the, you need to be itemizing. There is a special exception for 2021. You can contribute $300 to a charity or $600 if you're married uh, filing jointly of cash and get a charitable deduction for it. Whereas normally you wouldn't, it's a special rule because of COVID to try to encourage people to continue to make charitable contributions. And again, it has to be of cash. You can't uh, distribute uh, an asset. So you can't use stock for this or you know artwork or real estate, it has to be cash. And the recipient has to be a public charity. Um, so that's just, special. I don't know if that's gonna continue. There was a similar rule for 2020, although it was $300 whether you were single or married. Now it's three, it's, you get the benefit of both folks if you're married. And so it's $600 for a married couple. I don't know if that's gonna continue in future years or not, but that's um, a good benefit for folks who are making smaller uh, contributions and certainly are under the standard deduction for their deductions on their income tax returns. Okay, so I don't know if there's any more questions about sort of options to handle income tax questions with not deducting um, Otherwise, I can move on to the next section. There are, there are no other questions at the time. At OK, the time. great. Thank you. All right. So then we're going to talk about some options for appreciated property and the situation when, you know, maybe you have charitable intent and you want to make a gift, but you need to get something back. So we'll talk about those two scenarios. So the first scenario we're going to talk about, or the, com going to combine these scenarios, and so maybe you're in a situation where there's some stock that you've had for a long time or a piece of real rental real estate that you were taking um, depreciation on. And so you've got this asset, and if you sold it, there'd be a lot of capital gains tax associated with it. But you want to give something to charity, and you don't necessarily want to hold on to this asset for the rest of your life. And I hear this for folks as they get older, they've got the rental property, it's no longer fun to be a landlord, they'd really rather not deal with it anymore. 
um, and they want to give some money to charity. Uh, another issue might be that folks are in the situation where they want to make a charitable gift, but there's some concern that, you know, I still need to get some of the income from this asset now, or maybe I'm worried about needing the asset in the future. For example, we have Stanley here, our very food-oriented cat, and he's pretty concerned that there's not going to be enough food in the future. He's always looking for food and always demanding it. So some folks are like, you know, there might be unexpected health concerns. Maybe I'm working now, but I won't be working in the future. Am I going to have enough to support myself? Similarly, a lot of clients are providing financial support to family members. This could be the older generation, so they're having to send money back home to mom and dad to help them out a little bit, or even the, their kids. We're seeing a lot more of the age by which you know, kids are finally self-sufficient is increasing. And so many, I mean, a substantial percentage of Americans are providing financial support to their adult children. Um, and other situations too, you know, maybe you've got the family home and you're happy to be there now, um, but you know that your kids don't want to inherit it. They've established their lives somewhere else. The house isn't something they'd want to co-own with each other. And so maybe that's an option for something that you could do as a charitable gift. So the most simple, easy thing to do with appreciated assets. So you've got that stock that you've owned for a long time and it's worth a hundred times, you know, what it was when you bought it is to just give it to charity. If you make that donation of that appreciated asset to charity, the charity then sells it, but the charity is a nonprofit. So they don't have to pay that uh, capital gains tax on the appreciation. And so you get a lot more bang for your buck on your charitable contribution, because if you sold the asset, you'd have to pay capital gains tax at you know, possibly a 25% blended federal and state tax rate. And so now you're only giving 75 cents on the dollar to the charity. Whereas if you just contribute it to the charity, charity sells it, you're going to get a, a charitable deduction for the fair market value, as long as you've held it for a year. Um, so that's a great option. And the charity is not going to pay tax. So they're getting 100 cents on the dollar. There are two exceptions. So if you've only held, if you held the asset for less than a year, um, you're only going to be able to take a charitable deduction up to your basis, the amount that you paid for the asset. And if you're Distributing tangible personal property that's not used by the charity for its charitable purpose, you're also going to be limited. And this situation is, if I have a piece of artwork and I donate it to a museum, that's part of their charitable purpose. I will get a deduction equal to that artwork's fair market value. But if I take that same artwork and I donate it to the Feral Cat Coalition and they sell it, that's not related to their charitable purpose. They're not an art museum. So my deduction would be limited in that situation. But that's just a special rule. Um, for personal property, stock, things like that, real estate, that isn't going to be subject to that limitation. And now we're going to talk about a lot. Actually, I should pause there to see if there's any questions because this next bit is a bit longer. Um, we do not have any questions at this point. Okay. So nice Great. job. And I have to say, I love how you're bringing your cats into this. <laughs> It's, I'm telling you, I'm taking advantage of it while I can. <laughs> it's very relatable, and it and it also just you know it it, it makes a nice story. It connect, it connects well. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so our next category of gifts are called we're called split interest gifts, and see the, so these are we call it a split interest gift because you're making a gift to charity, but you're also either retaining part of the benefit or you're giving part of the benefit to a non charitable ben beneficiary, such as your family, like a, a child. Um, so we've got a couple of categories I'm going to go through. Uh, charitable gift annuities, charitable remainder trusts, charitable lead trusts, and then the gift of a remainder interest in your house. So one option is a charitable gift annuity. And this is a contractual relationship that you have with a charity where you give money to the charity. And in exchange, the charity promises to pay you an annuity for a period of, for, the, for your life. Um, and it's a contract with that charity. So they're kind of acting like an insurer, although the interest rates might be different than they would be with an insurer. So the contractor manages, I mean, the charity manages the assets and they are responsible for paying you your annuity payments every year. And they're taking the investment risk. So if they mismanage the assets or if the market tanks, they're still contractually obligated to pay you that annuity amount. Um, these annuities can take one of two forms. There are immediate annuities, which is I contribute money to the charity today 
and immediately it starts paying me back my annuity payment. Or maybe I'm in a situation where, you know, I don't need the income right now because I'm working, but I'm going to retire in two years. And then I'm definitely going to want to have this income stream. So I can do a deferred annuity where the payments don't start to a date that I set in the future. And therefore my payments are going to be a little bit larger because I'm having a few years where I'm not getting payments. This annuity could be paid to me or I could make a different person the beneficiary of the annuity. So if I'm in a situation where I'm having to send money to my parents to help them out every year and I have charitable intent, sometimes folks look at doing a charitable gift annuity where I make a contribution to the charity and then the annuity payments go to my parents. And these are things that we work with uh, clients and their CPAs or financial advisors to show maybe there's a tax benefit for doing that. And in many ways, you get more money to your family with fewer income tax consequences. And then you also know that you're benefiting charity in the end. Um, you, can, can, you can contribute appreciated property, so that stock that you've owned for a long time, to a charitable gift annuity. And then you don't have to recognize the gain immediately you recognize the gain slowly over time as you get the distributions, the annuity payments. If, however, I've named my parents as the beneficiary of the annuity, then I will have to recognize the gain all at once. Um, so this charitable annuity, gift annuity goes on, I get my annuity payments, and then when I die, what's left goes to the charity. So again, it's kind of that contractual relationship, and most charities will hold this back because they've got this contractual obligation so that they know that they will be able to cover it. Char the benefit of charitable gift annuities, I should say, too, is that they're relatively simple. They're usually a short, you know, maybe two page contract with the charity. There's no overhead for the donor. You just enter into this, you sign it, you get your payments. The charity gives you some tax information that you report on your tax return because you will be getting some amount of income every year from it. Um, but there's not a lot of overhead. So it's good for smaller gifts. Um, and then the, we, there are calculators that we use that tell us sort of what your charitable deduction would be if you do a charitable gift annuity. Some folks want more flexibility than this. So we're gonna talk about two options that are more complicated than this. Um, so they have more overhead associated, but they also give you a lot more options of things that you can do. Uh, so we'll start off talking about charitable remainder trusts. So this is a trust that the donor sets up and it's a trust. So it's an irrevocable trust that they contribute money to. And there's somebody who's acting as the trustee. And it could be the person who contributed the money, or it could be the charity, or it could be a third person. And that person, the trustee, is responsible for investing the funds. And so this is a way, unlike a charitable gift annuity, where the charity controls the investments, this is a way with a CR, we call them CRTs, for uh, the donor to still retain investment control. And we set these up, then the, the, this trust then has to make payments back to the donor or to a beneficiary for either life or a term of years. Um, there are limits. So if you do a term of years, it's gotta be between two and 20 years. And then once the term ends, either because I died or that term of years expired, the assets then pass to the charity. So this is not a contract in the same way with the charity because it's really, the charity is just another beneficiary. They're just not the beneficiary until you die. Unlike a charitable gift annuity where it's an annuity payment back, with a CRT, you can structure them one of two ways. You can have it be an annuity. So I'm gonna get X dollars every quarter for the rest of my life. Or I can set it up as a percentage. I'm gonna get 5% or 10% and that's called a charitable remainder uni trust, as opposed to a charitable remainder annuity trust. Um, there are flexibilities in the payment amounts and they don't have to be fixed. So we can have uh, CRTs that maybe vary a little bit in their payment and how much comes when and how long they are. But the, we do have to meet a test that the IRS imposes, which is at the time that the trust is created, there needs to be a reasonable probability that at least 10% of the value of the assets that I contributed to this trust will ultimately go to charity. And the IRS has these um, artificial interest rates that, that we have to use that are announced every year, or excuse me, every month. And so we run through these calculations to make sure that we satisfy this test. Now, some of the flexibility of a CRT is that you can name multiple charities and you can even retain the right to change the charities. And you can name a donor advised fund 
So for clients who maybe have multiple charities that they are involved with, or they have a long-term, they're going to do a 20-year uh, CRT, and they want to make sure that they're still comfortable with that charity, sometimes they want to retain these rights. Um, the, unlike a charitable gift annuity, with a CRT, the trust has the investment risk. So if the market tanks or the investments are poor and the trust runs out of money, then we're done. We just distribute out what's left. Um, to satisfy the annuity payment and nothing ends up going to charity. We just have a CRT that we call it, it failed. Um, so that's not a situation in which the charity is now on the hook. So all of that risk is, is held within the, uh, within the trust. And like I said, the donor can decide to be the trustee, which is the person who invests the assets, or they can name a third party. Um, and you're going to get a charitable deduction for this what's called the present value of the remainder interest. So again, we use these charts that the IRS provides us to determine what we, what we predict given this artificial interest rate the charity is gonna get in the end. And then we take the present value, which is how much do I have to invest today to get that amount of money in the future? And that's what your charitable deduction is. And this is what you work with your CPA accountant or attorney um, to determine, because we have software that'll do it. And then, this is also a vehicle that folks sometimes use appreciated property, because if I contribute that stock that I've held for a long time and the charity sells it, I don't have to recognize the gain immediately. I just recognize the gain pro rata as I get my distributions. So maybe I avoid having a big income tax hit in one year. I could spread it out over time. So those are, those are called charitable remainder trusts. There's the flip. The flip is called a charitable lead trust. So the lead interest instead of the remainder interest is charity. So this is a trust, again, that you set up. You contribute money to it. And then payments are made to one or more charities for a term of years. And then once that term ends, the assets pass back to the donor or somebody else, the beneficiary like the kids. Similar to a CRT, you can have this be a fixed dollar amount or a fixed percentage. And you can name multiple charities, or you could even give the trustee the discretion to select the charities. And you can also name a donor revised fund as the charity. Um, this, these are less common during life. Uh, the CRT is a much more common vehicle that people use during life, but CLTs are more common right now because the interest rate that the IRS is having us use is artificially low. And so it ends up being a really effective way to get money to your kids after the charitable interest ends with a low cost to using up your gift tax exemption because of this ridiculously low interest rate that the IRS has its use right now. Not all CLTs are set up to give you a charitable deduction. A lot of times these are set up instead as a way for me to benefit charity, but also leverage a gift to my kids. Um, so if the if you want to get an income tax deduction when you make the contribution to the charitable lead trust then you have to agree to be legally responsible for the trust's income taxes during the term of the trust so if it sells assets and has capital gain you end up having to pay that tax if if you're contributing cash to a charitable lead trust and then the trustee invests in non-income producing assets that they just hold on to and they don't generate income, then that's a great option because I've gotten the charitable deduction and this trust isn't producing much income, so I'm not having to pay a lot of income tax over the term of the trust. Sometimes, though, the idea is to contribute highly appreciated assets, and so you don't want to be liable for the income taxes. You want the trust to be liable so that the charitable deduction is given. So you forfeit the charitable deduction at the outset. But again, the benefit is that the charity then sells the asset. It doesn't pay income tax. And so in the end, after the trust ends and the assets go to your kids, you were able to take an asset that had a lot of capital gain involved and never have to pay capital gains tax on that gain. Um, and again, similar to a CLT, CRT, the trust has the investment risk. Um, I can retain the right to invest the assets but I can't, if I do that, then I can't have a situation I said where, where the trustee every year selects the charities. If you want the trustee to be able to select the charities, then we have to have a, a, somebody else act as trustee. The donor can't be the trustee. And then another option that's out there is to give an interest in your house. 
So what this is, is you actually deed over your house to the charity, but you retain the right to live in the house, either for a term of years or for your life. And then you have a contractual relationship, a contract with a charity that says that you're responsible for paying the taxes and all of the upkeep and maintenance. Um, but you get to live in, you get a charitable deduction for the gift, the future interest of that gift that the charity is going to get when, when you die or the term ends, but you still get to live in the house. Um, and this has to be your personal residence or your farm. So it can't be your vacation home or your rental. It can't be your rental property. It's got to be your residence or farm. Um, and this is an option for folks who either don't have children or know that their kids aren't necessarily going to be interested in the house and they wanted, they don't have a lot of assets that they're comfortable gifting right now. This is one alternative that sometimes we see. So I think this is a good place for me to stop if there are questions. Um, there aren't any specific. If anybody has them, feel free to put them in the Q&A right now. Um, but this is definitely one that I haven't heard as much about, this gift of a remainder interest in, in the house. Yeah, it's not as common, um, but it is out there. I think it, you know, right now, and I'll be talking about this later, the federal exemption is $11.7 million. Um, so that's pretty high. And so most people are not concerned about federal estate taxes. Back when the exemption was $600,000, I think we, we saw this more because estate taxes were something that hit people more, especially with their house, because the house would appreciate in value. They plan on living it, living in it. Um, they have charitable intent. And then, you know, because you don't own the house when you die, it's not taxed at your death. So it's not something we see as often, but we do, it does pop up occasionally. Well, well, great. Um, we got a question on this. Um, yeah. Does the gift of the house act as a sale? Um, so as far as no, as, as far as it does not trigger capital gains tax because you're contributing it to charity. So this is only going to work, generally speaking, if you do not have a mortgage, right? This is the house that you own outright because the lender is not going to let you do that. But it's not considered a sale for recognizing capital gains tax. Um, so you would avoid that. All right. Um, we have another question. I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the options. Can I hire someone to help me plan it out? If so, what's the general cost of something like that? Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely a lot of folks who can help you with different options. Um, I would say that the charitable gift annuity, the, the cost of entry there is pretty low. And oftentimes people just talk with charities to try to set those up um, and maybe just talk to their CPA about it. The charitable remainder trust, the charitable lead trust, or even the gift of the house generally requires you to hire an attorney to do that work. Um, and and it, they can be expensive. A lot of times in these situations, we also are working with a financial advisor who's been pushing this because they're the ones running all of the different scenarios to show you different options because there's lots of variables. So what you're gonna get back and your potential charitable deduction can, are just moving targets and we can run the numbers many different ways to get to different results depending upon your goals. I would say as far as the attorney costs to set up a charitable remainder trust or a charitable lead trust and to do some of the work of giving you an idea of some of the ramifications probably starts at $5,000, maybe it goes up from there. It depends upon how involved other advisors are. If you're relying on me, for example, to do all of this, the calculations for you, it's just gonna cost more than if your financial advisor or your CPA is doing that. Um, but I, it's definitely, um, the other thing I should mention too, is I would not consider doing a charitable remainder trust unless you were contributing $100,000, $200,000 you want to look at it as, as a charitable gift annuity for amounts lower than that because the overhead costs of this trust and just the cost to get into it um, are so high, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, I haven't talked about the details, but these trusts become separate taxpayers. They have special tax reporting requirements. There's just some overhead every year associated with them. Does that answer the question? Uh, I think you answered that very well. And and I I do understand that there's so many options and then the different options have different benefits and the benefits are at different times and yep. people have different amounts that they want to contribute or they have family members as you were saying that they're 
feeling of responsibility or desire to be directing funds um, to help them as well. So everybody's situation is unique. And, and, and if you are listening and you're feeling like, wow, my head is spinning a bit, um, this will be recorded. You can go back and listen to it again. And Vanessa is um, you know, obviously very well skilled in this and can um, be a, a resource for you in the future or direct you to others who might be able to help you. So think of this as a way to, to gain some good information and um, do keep writing down your questions that can be asked tonight or when you do meet with someone. Yeah, and I would say that for clients that I've had that have done like CRTs, for example, it's not like I introduce the idea and then they're on board and we do it. It's, it's conversations that take time. We have to introduce the idea. It's all very foreign to people. And so it's, it's oftentimes just revisiting it a few times before people get a better understanding and feel more comfortable with it. Um, it can take a period. It can take, honestly, years for folks to sort of get comfortable with it um, and to sort of discuss it and, and have questions because it is it's a large commitment and it is just a foreign area for a lot of folks because you don't think about this stuff all the time. Great. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to talk about back to the question, first question that we had about ways to include charity in your estate plan. So we're going to talk about what issues people might be facing and some different options to handle this. And I always tell clients, you know, there are a million different options and, and variables, and I can give you a million different scenarios and options for your estate plan. But my goal is to talk with you, find out what your goals are, what your concerns are, and then give you one or two options to meet those and then tell you the pros and cons of them and help you make a decision. So it's understandable to be overwhelmed because there are endless uh, options here, but these are some just maybe categories that people can think about, and then you can talk with your advisors uh, to narrow it down. So here's the issue. Um, Oregon, you, if you live in Oregon, uh, imposes an estate tax on estates over a million dollars. The rate is graduated. It starts at 10% on the amount over a million, and it goes up to 16%. Uh, you don't get to 16% until you have about $9.5 million of assets. I don't know if folks on this call are in Washington. Washington also has an estate tax. It has a little over a $2 million exemption, but its rate is higher. It goes up to 20%. I mentioned before, there is a federal estate tax as well. It's currently 11.7 million. That number will be reduced by half at the end of 2025. And it potentially can get reduced more further by Congress. Like for example, I think um, the Bernie Sanders tax plan had it at 3.5 million. And your taxable estate includes your retirement, your house, your stock accounts, your cars. And so for some folks with real estate in Portland, it's not that hard for them to end up with a, with a Oregon taxable estate um, between their retirement accounts, maybe some life insurance in their house. Many folks are over that million dollar rate uh, level. Um, and so here we have Benny. And so Benny is pretty sure that this geodesic dome that I built him with all of my Amazon boxes during COVID um, is going to appreciate greatly in value, and he's definitely going to have an estate tax problem. And so he wants to know what his options are. So one option is charitable bequests. So these are gifts that you have in your estate plan that says, hey, when I die, whether it's your estate plan is a will or a trust, you say, when I die, I want to give these assets to charity. And you can give cash or other property. So you can say, I want X dollars to go to charity or you can say, I want this piece of real estate to go to charity. And you can structure it as a dollar amount or a percentage. So some folks are just like, they know what they want as far as I want $5,000 to go to this charity. And some folks maybe want to do it as a percentage. They would like 10% of their estate. And then we can do a combination. So maybe they want to make sure that at least $5,000 goes to their estate, but or goes to charity. But if they ended up with a lot more money when they died than they thought, it should, it should increase and so we can do greater than or lesser than formulas. And the benefit of doing this is that when we're looking at the assets that are gonna be taxed in your estate, we subtract out the assets that go to charity. So if I have an estate that's $1.2 million and I give $100,000 to charity, I only have $100,000 now subject to the estate tax. That $100,000 to charity gets to charity tax-free because I've got this charitable estate tax deduction. And so that could be really useful. Um, and, and again, these are gifts that you would put in your will or your trust. So to answer the question as to what happens if it's unexpected death, 
that would be something you would consider putting into um, your estate planning documents. Another option is to name charity as a beneficiary on, uh, on a beneficiary designation. So for retirement assets or life insurance, um, you could definitely name charity as a beneficiary of your life insurance, but what's really, really good and very tax efficient is to name charity as a partial or full beneficiary of your retirement accounts. So if I have a retirement account, I've got an IRA and I leave it to my child. When my child take, not only when I die, that IRA is included in my estate and subject to estate tax if, I, if I'm wealthy enough. When my child gets the IRA and if he or she takes a distribution from the IRA, they have to pay income tax on that distribution. Just like I do when I take a distribution. Well, it used to be that kids or other beneficiaries could use their life expectancy to create the, to determine what the required minimum distributions are. So where, while they are gonna have to recognize income tax on the distributions, they, could, they were able to stretch those distributions out over their life expectancy. So the time value of money, it wasn't such a bad problem. Well, Congress changed that on us in 2019 in December with the SECURE Act. Now, if I leave assets to my child who's an adult and isn't disabled, my child has to take those distributions by, has to withdraw all of the money from the retirement account by the 10 year anniversary of my death and pay all the corresponding income tax. So not only do I have to pay estate tax, my beneficiary has to pay income tax on the distributions, and now maybe they have to pay that income tax sooner than they did before. If you name charity as a beneficiary, those problems don't exist because a charity is not subject to estate tax and the charity is not subject to income tax. So if you would say, if you in your beneficiary designation say 10% of my IRA goes to charity, that they're getting 100 cents on the dollar. In situations where if you're, if, you're well, if you're lucky enough to be subject to federal estate tax and state estate tax, and then the beneficiary subject to income tax, the beneficiary is only gonna get like 15 cents on the dollar for the retirement benefit, whereas the charity gets 100 cents on the dollar. So I always tell clients with have charitable intent and have some retirement accounts, hey, let's look, look at using your retirement assets first. Now there is one complication in that most providers, although they're getting a little bit more flexible, won't let you say a dollar amount. So your retirement uh, plan provider won't let you say, I want $5,000 to go to charity, you have to do a percentage because they're concerned about what do we do if there's only $2,000 in the account. That's changing a little bit, but we did, we end up doing some formula type gifting to make up makeup gifts. There's ways to handle that, but just to be aware that usually it's gonna to have to be a percentage. Um, now there's also some planning that people are now coming up with and thinking about doing because of that loss of that lifetime stretch for the kid that I talked to you about and about they have to take the contributions within 10 years. What if instead I name a CRT at the charitable remainder trust as a beneficiary of my life insurance or my retirement account. And then it can say, make distributions to my child over their lifetime. And so that's a way to kind of replicate that lifetime stretch that we could do prior to the change in the law um, with a charitable gift. Now it, it only works for clients who have charitable intent because some money is going to go to charity, obviously. And so there's a little bit less going to your child. So it's not exactly the same as what we were able to do before the change in the law, but it's a great option potentially for folks who want to uh, parse out or slow down the distributions to their kids and also want to benefit charity. Um, and then when we talked about the CRTs and the CLTs, these are also things that you don't have to wait. You can also have your estate plan do. So it might not be a gift or a contribution you make during life, it might be something that your will or your trust says. So when I die, could you get $100,000 to a CRT and here are the terms of the CRT? Or more commonly, we do CLTs, which is the gift goes to charity first and then what's left in the end goes to the kids. And so this is a good way for us to minimize the usage of our exemption. So if, I have, if I'm fortunate enough to have $20 million, um, I can use this plan to get money to my kids without having to use as much of my exemption because when you run the numbers, assuming that the assets are invested well, you end up 
I may maybe in making this contribution, the gift to my child was considered to be $4 million. And so we used up 4 million of my exemption. But the reality is when the trust ends, my child's gonna get like $9 million or whatever that we run the different scenarios um, because of the way that the assets appreciate and because of the artificial interest rate that the IRS has you use. So this is another option that sometimes we, that we will do for folks um, who again have charitable intent, but also are looking at ways of minimizing estate taxes. So in case you were wondering how it went for Benny, um, here's his geodesic dome that I made him with the Amazon boxes. And then you can see that he had some uh, intruders come and step on his house and maybe cause some structural damage. And then ultimately it got chewed on and completely destroyed and had to be recycled. So that is what I have so far as far as this presentation, but I'm definitely happy to answer questions that folks have. You know, um, anybody who has questions to please add them um, right now. I'm wondering if you want to cover just even some basics. So the things that people could do that aren't maybe majorly, um, I don't want to say sophisticated, but some of these seem rather sophisticated um, with you know, I think you might have touched on that earlier, but you can just like, like when you're creating your will list organizations and how, how do people go about doing maybe even just the more simple things? Yeah. So it's very common for clients to have their will or their tr revocable trust say, when I die, pay the expenses of administration and then make these charitable gifts. Give $5,000 to this charity and $10,000 to this charity. And they list those charities. And then the residue of my estate goes to my children. So that's a very common way to do it. Or we have them make similar kinds of designations of percentages in their retirement accounts to get the tax benefit. But you know, if you're doing your estate planning, it's not that big of a deal to just add set dollar amount gifts or maybe percentages to charity in that planning process. So that's common. Um, just making gifts to charity, you know, whether it be cash or an appreciated asset is another simple way without having to involve a trust or attorneys. Um, and similarly, if the charity offers charitable gift annuities, that's an option if you're wanting to do that. Although that does involve a bit more complication because you do wanna know, you have to have somebody calculate for you the um, charitable deduction and so forth. Um, what else? I mean, those I think are probably, you know, a lot of folks do just sort of list charities in their estate plan, or maybe you have, you know, an asset that you want, know that nobody in the family is going to want and you would rather it go to charity. So you say, instead of a dollar amount, you say this asset goes to charity. Nice, nice. And then being that the cats are um, important to all of us and to you, <laughs> I see them. I love that geodesic dome that you made and I love how, how perfect those triangles were. Um, <laughs> I know, COVID, we had some time. Yeah, I had way too much time on my hands. <laughs> it's beautiful. So beautiful. Um, is what happens if we have animals and they may outlive us? How can yeah. we incorporate that into our planning? So again, it's a, I think of it as a spectrum of simple and straightforward, but and then really complicated, depending upon how much control and concerns you have. So I tell clients, you know, hey, I've got this cat. I want to make sure, you know, or my cats, okay, for example, I want to make sure that they're taken care of. And I have a friend who I know either will take care of them herself or she'll find a home for a good home for them. And I trust her to do that. And so my estate plan says it's actually for me as my cat sitter. I'm like, if I die, uh, my cats go to Libby and give her the sum of $5,000 and with the hope that she either keeps the cats or finds a suitable home for them. And I trust that Libby is going to take that $5,000 and use it for their support, give it to the people who end up taking care of my cats. I'm not worried about her taking the money and then putting my cats down or something like that because I've named her because I trust her. So that's a, that's a super simple option uh, if, if you wanna make a plan for it. I mean, you can even just say my cats go to Libby, but I like to encourage people to think of some sort of monetary amount because pets are expensive. They have medical needs and food and all of that. So that's one option. Uh, there are programs like with the Oregon Humane Society that they have where if you agree to make a contribution to them, they will help try to find a home for your pet when you're gone. So that's another option. If you don't have like a friend that you can trust to kind of do that. But then there are some clients who either don't have anyone that they can trust, they're really worried about it, 
or they're thinking of larger dollar amounts because the animal has healthcare needs that are expensive or it's a horse, which the, you know, the, the boarding and the food for a horse is significant. Or I, as I met, I have a client who has a parrot that's gonna outlive everybody. Um, and so none of those options really make them comfortable. Oregon law does allow you to create what's called a pet trust. And so your estate plan would say, when I die, my pets and a significant sum of money goes to this newly created special trust for the benefit of my pet. And so that is an option that we have. It is not one that I think is very commonly used because there's a lot of questions that start popping up. What kind of distributions are going to be made? So now, now we've got a trust. The trust has a trustee. So that's the person who's in charge of investing the assets and deciding when distributions are made. And then we have a custodian or caretaker of the pet. That's the person who's got the pet in their custody and taking the day-to-day -day care of the pet and has to go to the trustee and ask for money. This whole trust is a separate taxpayer and it has to file an income tax return every year. And maybe the trustee wants to take a fee. So there's some costs there. And then the caretaker, you know, do they get paid for their time? And if they're getting paid, what sort of restrictions do we have on that? Um, there are some examples in, in the media, but I know uh, there's, and there's been some litigation even in Oregon on this. If you've got a situation where you're very, very wealthy and you say, okay, my housekeeper can stay in my mansion in Dunthorpe while my cat is still alive and she'll get a stipend of $5,000 a month to care for my cat and she can live there rent free. That cat is never going to die. That cat is going to be a 30 or 40 year old cat. How do we know it's the same cat? She's just going to keep finding another orange cat and saying, oh no, this is Benny. Benny's just doing really, really well. So do I need to put in my trust provisions that say, okay, every year, the trustee can DNA test the cat to make sure it's the same cat. You know, I mean, it, it, there's, and there, I think there was, some there was some litigation in Oregon, I think it was a horse maybe, where this actually came up where there was a question as to whether it was the same horse. So those are the kinds of things, the discussions I have to have with clients when they want to do um, a pet trust. So I don't often do them because I do think that there, there's just a lot of unknowns with that. I much prefer that first option of I've got the close trusted friend that I know loves animals as much as I do and they'll do the right thing. That's kind of my preferred approach just because it's simpler. Nice. I know it's on a lot of people's mind. So that's, that's very helpful. Um, I do see in your photo here that not only did um, one of your cats destroy your beautiful home that you created, but then they didn't go far away to just sit down and contemplate what they've done. So <laughs> yeah. very nice. Um, anybody else uh, this evening have a question that we haven't addressed or any concerns, something maybe you thought you would, would learn tonight that wasn't addressed or anything that is confusing? We're, we're certainly here to assist you and um, Vanessa um, can certainly answer questions offline and um, and depending on where you are, maybe you have a financial planner that's a good person to speak with or a CPA, or um, maybe you're able to recommend or give some guidance in that as well. Vanessa? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, as folks, you know, just, I can, I'm always happy to give referrals to folks too. If I'm not the right fit for an, as an attorney or if people are looking for um, accountants or advisors, I can definitely talk with them and kind of give them options. Um, and I will back up here in my slides to the first one that has my contact information. So it's down there in the right corner. If you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to talk to folks. Oh, no, that's great. Super helpful. And I want to thank everybody who came this evening um, to learn a little bit more. Um, you have a very kind, generous heart within you, um, even looking into things like this, not only um, you know, helping your family and making your own plans, but perhaps looking to help um, organizations that are important to you. And um, hopefully Feral Cats in that list is part of it. But, but even if we're not, you are really um, thoughtful and compassionate for, be pl for planning ahead and for thinking about something like this. So we're really grateful for that interest and um, glad you were here this evening. And I also wanna thank you, Vanessa, for, um, for assisting and walking us through this so nicely. Oh, thank you. 
Um, this was again recorded. So if you uh, want to listen to any of it later, um, we'll make sure that a copy is available for you with a link. And I think that concludes us for the evening. Everyone stay safe. I hope the snow isn't what they said it will be. And um, thank you again for attending. Thanks, everyone.